Hello again. Back again. The return of the champ, baby. Have no fear, for your Irish papa is here. Today, to begin, since we're not at war with anyone, I thought we may begin with some tournaments here in Ireland. Winning tournaments here should also help us win over the hearts and minds of the people. After winning several rounds, we found ourselves in a duel with a British Hussar, which we easily won. There were hardly any tournaments in Ireland at the time, so we decided to travel back to Pembroke and check in on the city. While here, though, we also decided to speak with the Dark Master and go about purchasing a few dinghies for our men and for our army. Now, with our very own fleet, of ships, albeit quite small, we would be able to travel the seven seas. And though, yes, I do have some more adventurous plans for us this episode, for now we're going to be traveling back to France where we would invest our time in some more tournaments. There were a few reasons as to why we were doing this. One, because doing this would get us plenty of renown and thus would eventually increase our party size and our clan tier, but also because we needed to make some money while we're moving like this. As we continued our national tour of tournament victories, we would also begin moving a bit further south. All the while, we were sure to perform our protective and policing duties to the nation and her fine people as well. Not that we really minded, as it brought us great joy anyhow. As mentioned though, we were headed south, so far south indeed, that we were going to be back on the African continent once more to see her beautiful lands and beautiful people. My wife was tickled plum pink about the entire expedition. She had never been any farther south than Spain before, and that was was when she was just a wee little lass. Ah, yes, it's been far too long, like seeing an old friend after a while. I see the local bandits are still running rampant around these parts. Perhaps we could help out the local law enforcement a bit, eh? We would eventually arrive at the beautiful seaside city of Rabat. Mon Amour was very intrigued and delighted by the architecture of the city. Such beauty in these structures here, all from simple sandstone. We came early in the morning because we knew if we waited too long, the marketplace would be absolutely bustling. They had many items on display for sale, beautiful pottery, some of the finest armor and apparel that this region has to offer. And one particular gentleman was selling firearms. I found a rifle. Not just any rifle though, this was a Jezail rifle? A very interesting foreign make. It would seem even their deadly weapons here are just as beautiful as the landscape. It should be noted however, it took a little bit longer to reload and didn't pack quite the same punch as my expertly crafted flintlock musket. But the projectile was faster and more importantly it was much more accurate as well. I decided to purchase it as a souvenir of our travels. But perhaps a bit of target practice is in order. Yes indeed, I think that'll do nicely. We would eventually arrive at the beautiful city of Marrakesh, and it would seem that they are indeed holding a tournament here as well, a perfect opportunity to earn more glory and riches. We had been faring so well in so many of these tournaments, the locals had began to refer to me as the Sand Devil. Many a desert bandit would tremble in fear at my new moniker, and for good reason. After encountering many of these bandits, eventually we would rescue several kidnapped Moroccan peasants. These peasants and militiamen alike would tell us of a nearby desert bandit hideout. Hopefully, with its eradication, it'll put quite a damper on the crime in the area. Under the cover of night, my men and those Moroccan peasants who sought revenge against the bandits for kidnapping them would infiltrate the camp. We decided to take a bit of a stealthier approach, taking out our enemies from afar. No doubt, though, they would be able to hear our rifles going off. We eventually came upon a shallow cave system within the mountain. It would seem that the bandits have made this their home. Like a bunch of rats scurrying in the dark, we would exterminate them. The scourge and filth of this desert would be cleansed by our mighty hands, and we took great pride and joy in our civil service to the nice folks of these lands. Eventually, the captain of this sorry outfit would approach us and request a duel with myself. Just as all the others thus far, a man without honor challenges me to an honorable duel. Very well then, sir. Very well. 
Put down like the dog that he was. The question now, what do we do with all his men? Besides, murderers and thieves deserve a special kind of treatment. Instead of executing them, I decided to take them prisoners so that I may take them back to a nearby city so that they could face proper justice. As a foreigner of these lands, it wouldn't be right of me to deprive the fine Moroccan peasants of their justice. We received a good bit of bounty money for the bandits' heads, and I would actually put it back into the local economy by hiring hiring many militiamen to come with me on my journey. We would begin traveling out east as we had heard of many much larger organizations and gangs. We had spotted a massive gathering of bandits in a party that the size of which would rival even our own. Unlike the fine folks of our party though, these bloodthirsty criminals were not nearly as well equipped, nor did they have the endless seasons of combat experience of our Frenchmen, which made it more than easy for us to cut them down in their prime like a dead willow tree, with so many branches to prune before we would rip out the stump itself. And with this victory, these lands were sure to be much safer without an army of bandits roaming the dunes. As we continued moving further east, we would ensure to help reduce the unemployment rate by hiring some infantry. It had been so long since we had traveled this far east on the continent that we had almost forgotten how difficult it can be to navigate. We had eventually finally returned to the city of La Guardia. They too seemed to be holding a tournament in the city, and for old time's sake, I decided to try my hand at it, along with Sven, of course. You could imagine our excitement when the two of us found out that it was a rifle competition and we easily won. Nothing like memories made with your best pal. While exploring the city markets, we would come upon a new foreign type of weapon known as an Abbas gun. It seemed to be some type of hand cannon, as it had incredible damage, but was extremely inaccurate and slow to reload. It did look mighty majestic, however, so there's that. Near the city of Le Guat was yet another desert bandit hideout. This would be the perfect opportunity for us to try out our new weapon. We would bring many soldiers from the nearby towns as they knew these lands much better than anyone else. And as night fell, we began to make our move once more. It was also during this time that I realized just how inaccurate this new gun was. I did finally manage to hit one gentleman right in the chest with it completely caving in his chest cavity, it would seem this weapon is best used at point-blank range. Fine by me as I had no problem getting up close and personal, but the reload for the weapon was a bit of a bitch, I must say. Nevertheless, we would continue moving forward. These bandits, just as the previous hideout, seemed to have some type of cave system for their base. I found that my two-handed greatsword given to me by the King of France himself was of particular usefulness in here. And then once more the captain and some of his men that remained and weren't killed by us already came out and of course he challenged me to a duel which I accepted. I realize challenging me to these duels is an act of desperation, but when will they learn? We would continue our glorious campaign across the continent of Africa, killing bandits and looters alike. I had hoped to make my way towards Egypt as I had heard great tales of the cities there, but something ended up coming up. It would seem that the British have declared war on France, something that I was not expecting given the circumstances. We began making our way towards Spain so that we could try to head back towards France, all the while while pondering if this was a mistake to come to Africa and make a campaign across the continent at all. But could you blame me? We couldn't have expected them to rise against us so soon given the devastation they faced in the last war. Regardless of rhyme or reason though, we were indeed at war again. As we traveled through France, we would begin recruiting as many soldiers as possible for the cause. As we traveled back to England, I noticed they had already taken Pembroke from my control. My party was much too small to take the city back on my own. I would need help. My only choice was to travel to Ireland to try and meet up with the King of France's army. They were just outside the city of Waterford and were about to begin a siege. The prospect of taking back Pembroke from the British was desirable, but liberating an Irish city itself and possibly becoming the Lord even more so. The snowfall was quite heavy, but as were the defenses and fortifications of our enemies. I hadn't been to Waterford since I was a young lad, but I do remember my father telling me that this city was an absolute behemoth in terms of its defenses. 
This will not be easy. Even with us having twice as many troops as the enemy, this was not going to be a walk in the park. I would do my best to try and defend the siege towers as well as our battering ram from the riflemen atop the city walls. But there were more than a few times where the retaliatory fire had me and our soldiers pinned down behind barricades. During the chaos, I would eventually locate my wife, who actually seemed to be faring quite well on her own. Perhaps we actually have a hope of taking this city after all. But it takes more than confidence and bravery to scale these mighty walls and take out those atop them. Once again during this time, I would focus my efforts on the enemy riflemen trying to distract them from killing our soldiers who were climbing the ladders. I had lost hope though when I noticed that one of our siege towers had been completely destroyed and those who were pushing it killed. Our battering ram had seen a little more success as all of those who tried to infiltrate the gates were killed as well. The king and his men had finally come to reinforce us, but I fear it may be too late. Though it was great that the king had finally arrived to inspire and motivate his men to continue pushing, things were becoming quite dire. For example, I personally had ran out of musket balls, meaning my specialty of long-range combat was nullified and void. My sword is all I had and I planned on using it to charge next to these brave men and women. I very well may die here today, but know that I die happily in my homeland. Or so I had planned on doing, but as I approached the group, shots rang out and the king began to recall his men. They were withdrawing from the battlefield and unfortunately none of my men were among them to help me continue. I too would be forced to retreat and Waterford was still under the control of the British and I had completely failed its citizens. After our retreat we would make the long journey back towards Pembroke and ultimately towards London. The city was rebelling against France once more and we were here to try and quell any uprisings. By this point we had been here to live the city so many times it was becoming second nature to us. Especially in this case where this uprising was mostly fueled by a few peasants and militiamen that were hardly trained. Though I must say it was this exact line of thinking that led me to underestimate these peasants and militiamen and thus they had destroyed our siege towers. Luckily though our battering ram had made it to the city gates. It was quite easy to tear through the gates as these poor fools had hardly cobbled together any barricades. I will give them credit it though as it was quite hard for us to find our footing they were funneling us right through the doorway. Clever tactics are useful but in a case like this I find that brute force works best to make your way through them. The crowd began to disperse and or hit the ground as our muskets went off and we began planting some axes and swords inside their skulls for them. Now the king and his men were on their way so I decided to move up top and try to take out the artillery that would be firing down upon their soldiers. Four greenhorn gentlemen against me with my mighty sword. As you might imagine, the four of them didn't stand even a fraction of a chance. And yet, here we have it, another liberation of London under our belts. It wasn't Waterford, but at the very least, they wouldn't be subjugated to English rule anymore and would be subjugated to French rule. Not really much I could do about that, though. Besides, the city is a great staging point for any future invasions on the island. Speaking of which, we would stick with the king and his army and move towards Penrith Castle, our father-in-law's domain, as it was currently under invasion of British forces and we were here to try and assist them. Unfortunately, however, after this great battle, the Kingdom of Spain would also declare war on us, meaning that France is now fighting a war to the north and to the south. My issue with the situation is this is most likely going to persuade the king to try and make peace with Great Britain. So we'll have to try and do everything in our power to take back as much as we can before that happens. During our travels, we passed by Pembroke once more and I noticed that it was in complete rebellion against the British. Which was good for us because the more enemies that they have, the longer we can keep our war with them going. But I only pray that they may be able to keep their sovereignty. The people of that city are good Welsh folks. In even better news, my third son was born and my wife had finally gave him a proper name that wasn't Bobby. He was going to be named Connor and you know what, this time I like it. The birth of my third born son was 
would be celebrated immensely with the devastation of several a British army. Unfortunately for her, the Lady Sarah would be the first of many to encounter my swift wrath. For a time, we would also patrol the nearby cities and towns around London itself. It would be up to us and a few others to ensure its protection as the king had traveled back to France to make war with the Spanish. Originally, during this war's beginning, we had lost many of our territories, but we had taken many of them back as well, and we were even beginning to take some new, such as Broughton Castle itself. Those poor English fools had made this entire castle out of kiln wood. Perhaps if scaling the walls doesn't work, we could start a great big fire. Then again, I suppose if we did that, we wouldn't be able to take it for our own now, would we? Such a shame. Nevertheless, our victory here today at taking the castle would promote our clan from a tier 3 clan to a tier 4 clan, further expanding our party size limit. But I will say I was none too impressed as we had only got an increase of maybe 24 to 25 in the party size, and so I've decided to add the unlimited party size mod. Some of you may disagree with this, and if you do, I apologize, but allow me to explain as to why. I feel that this is fair because we are well known throughout Africa and Europe and I'm sure out towards the east they're well aware of who we are as well. And with such a great big reputation as well as so many victories under our belt it only seems fitting that anyone would be willing to join us of course and we would have the know-how on governing such a large body of troops. Now I had planned on amassing a very large army as much as we could afford at the very least but Sven has been under our governing for so long I thought that it was only fair that we give him his very own party to command. Besides, with the king back in France, we could use all the help that we could get here. We would need to be quick though, as it seems that peace talks are currently in the works and King Louis is all too eager to end this war. We would amass an army of 224 men strong, mostly comprised of militia nevertheless. But we had come a liberating force here to take back Tralee Castle, the first siege that we would oversee all on our own. The towers, the battering ram, and even we ourselves were more than ready for this. It was time to begin. We immediately began rushing the walls of the castle. I would stay mounted on horseback for a while until the men had finally reached the gates. My best attempt here would be to try to distract the riflemen once more. And this did indeed seem to be working for the most part. We would have to try to play it as careful as possible, though, as the numbers inside the castle matched our own. By this point, their cannons had already taken out our battery ram as well as our secondary siege tower, but one of them was a shining light in a dark world, our last hope of scaling these walls. I would personally ensure the protection of the tower as we close the gap between it and the castle itself. However, I am afraid it was on its last legs. And before we even had a chance to utilize it, it was crumbling before us. Damn, the situation was becoming more and more grim by the moment. Our only chance now of winning this battle would be to tear down this gate with our axes and swords. Me and my men would begin working on this. Nothing was going to stand in our way, especially not some flimsy wooden doors. We broke through and continued pushing our mighty advance forward, slowly hacking and slashing our way through wooden gates and people alike to make it into the courtyard of this damned castle. We would spill as much blood as we had to to conquer it. As my men took over the courtyard, I and I alone would scale the walls and begin taking on every single defending British soldier that I came across. With sword, pistol, and rifle in hand, I would fight my way up every single level. Now that I've sunk my fangs in deep into this place, there was no one alive who could strip it from me. All of those who stood in my way were trampled with the might of a thousand horses. The bravery of these artillerymen was indeed admirable, but I would only reward it with a trip to the afterlife. I'm sure the creator will be impressed with your resolve, soldiers, but I am not. This battle was finally over. 
and we had conquered this castle. Our first major victory, a colossal success led by me and me alone. Trilly Castle was liberated once more and under our control, but better yet, free of British oppression. We had lost many of our men during the assault, so we would begin traveling to small Irish towns to try and replenish our ranks. There was still a lot of work that needed to be done, so many large armies that still needed to be conquered on the island, such as the noble Lord John here, who just so happened to be commanding one of the largest armies in the entire country at the time. We'll see what we can do about that. Now meeting on this flat ground on a dark and stormy night wasn't exactly ideal for a combat, but we did have quite the advantage in numbers and I was also quite familiar with the Irish landscape so we should be just fine. I was afraid it'd be quite hard to see and thus quite hard to fight given the environment and the weather but they made it easy for us standing in one gigantic group, like a bunch of confused ducks being circled by a pack of wolves. Truth be told, I'm not sure they could have made it any easier for us to achieve this victory. Yet another glorious achievement of taking down a large army without any assistance from our allies. A vote would come up shortly thereafter for who should be the owner of Trilly Castle, being that we took it ourselves and we were the lord of it before we voted for ourselves but the king did not give it to us. A spiteful move on his behalf, perhaps our independence from France is something that's needed on the horizon. That is, of course, an option that we'll need to consider for the future. As for now, though, we'll continue our crusade across Ireland, freeing it as much as possible. At some point, I had some much larger ambitions, and I had hoped to end this episode with a gigantic army of ours taking over an Irish city and or liberating it, of course the city of Schliga. No doubt their defenders are dug in deep here. This would be a mighty bloody battle as we hardly outnumbered them. But to my surprise, after many days of building our siege camp, it all ended at once. France had signed peace with Great Britain. Damn that Louis, once again ruining my plans. But now that the peace treaty had been signed, there was nothing we could do. We would head to Trilly Castle to donate many of our army to the garrison there, ensuring the safety of the citizens within in the case of another war, which is sure to come. With the war finally over, I felt it would be best for us to return to our governed settlements here at Powys Castle. Besides, we had missed the sights of their friendly faces here, as well as a proper bed to sleep in that wasn't on the campaign trail. We had much work to do here as well, such as inspecting the gear of our soldiers to ensure that it is up to par, as well as discussing their defensive and training techniques. But as we took a walk to the Lord's Hall, we began to ponder about what we should do. In specific, what we should do about our vassal ship to France. It was becoming clear to me that the King's interest and our own were beginning to clash. Yes, indeed, we have some big decisions to make. Perhaps you fine folks could provide some suggestions for me, such as what we should do once we have a tier 5 clan and we're able to create our own kingdom and country. But until then, I'll see you next time.